Welcome back to Welcome Back, the Improv Podcast. I'm your host, Zane Tron. Today, me and my friend Fiddler will host an improvised interview with made-up characters played by the other person. Welcome back to Welcome Back. I am your host, Sam Fiddler. I am very lucky to be joined by my guest here today. He has a gallery of his postmodern sculpture work entitled Echoes of Tub Toys Past, currently in residence at the Museum of Passable Art. I am here with Ernest Neodymium. Welcome to Welcome Back, Mr. Neodymium. Oh, it is a pleasure to be here, Fiddler. It's a pleasure to have all these questions for you, Mr. Neodymium. Now, for our listeners who may be unfamiliar with your work, as crazy as that sounds, tell us a little bit about your sculpture work and sort of My the sculptures themes. of the Tub Toys Past. Yes, that's your current gallery at the at the Museum of Passable Art. Yes, my, my current sculpture, my... Uh, how you say art pieces? Yes, you the call art them pieces. art pieces. I call them a lifestyle. <laughs> lifestyle. Uh, right, yes. Very no. Interesting. See, I don't make art because I'm an artist. I make art because it's all I've ever known. Hmm. See, I grew up with a bathtub, and that was it. I did not have a roof over my head. I did not have a ground under my feet. I float solely in air, five feet above the world. In a bathtub. And what so else would I have in a bathtub besides... A floating, a floating bathtub yes. is where you spent your childhood. I spent all my childhood, ages thrice to 15. Thrice uh, to 15. Yes. Very, very develop, important developmental years. It's important. That's where I learned uh, object permanence. Mm-hmm. It was around that time. Before then, I thought the world had left me because I could not see it. Therefore, it did not exist no more. And very at true. age three... When you start, which is when right you started. Bef- no, right, which is right before thrice. Okay. Age three, I invested uh, in a startup for a floating bathtub five feet above the world. And uh-huh. uh, it, it really, uh, how you say, blew up in everyone's faces because they added, uh, added C4 to the water, which was a big mistake. Oh, and so I it said, literally blew up. That's what I said. And people, I, I, I told the people in the industry, Wow, how about we add no C4 and keep the, the water that would be in there in the first place? And they said, humph, never thought of that. And so we did that, and they sent me off into space to test it, aged thrice to 15. And well, they sent me up there with a couple of knickknacks and doolios, and I had my rubber and I had my, my shakem rattle. I had a, a shape-shifting shark who was not a toy, but he was an accompanist. And I mean that as in he was not a friend, but any time I needed to sing a little jam to keep myself in, uh, in good moods the and not feeling alone, the shape-shifting shark would accompany with some viola mm-hmm. or uh, some bassoon. Uh, never other instruments, only viola or bassoon. And yeah. I'd, go, I'd grow um, very amused by orchestral music at these days. Mm. Uh, Yes, the shape-shifting shark, his name being Thallium, was very Thallium important. Was I did not name him, he named me. And did he? <laughs> this is very correct. He is named after the elements, hence why he gave me an elemental last name. Of Neodymium. Yes, Neodymium. But you were, you were earnest before that. It, I, was, it was at the age of thrice. Well, I was very it. earnest, but I was not named yet. Ah, that's very clever, sir. <laughs> oh. oh. So. I toy with you. So you're Much like the toys I had in exactly. my bathtub. Yes. Yeah, so to, to bring it to bring back to your sculpture work, this this current residence, your gallery at the Museum of Passable Art, yes. Echoes of Tub Toys Past. Yes. And this is a collection of a number of works from that period in which you were with in the tub with the shape shifting shark in space. I like to call it my black period. Your black period. Yes. Mainly because all I saw was blackness. Yes. Stars are not that much more visible from space, you might not believe. Oh, no, absolutely. But in space, you forget that there is a world around you, and you think, well, it's all gone except for me and Thallium and my tub toys. When, and you, when your world is a bathtub, there aren't that many colors to go around. That's, that's what's my quote in my biographer. <laughs> to say the least. So you, you mostly work with sculpture, and that's how you're known, and that's how you got this gallery at the MOPA. Yes. But you gained a little bit of notoriety last year for your exhibit in Central Park, which the New York Times called a performance art piece, but 
a lot of other people said that it didn't really fit in the genre. Tell us a little bit about that and how you made the headlines, so to speak. Well, I get they call it a performance art piece because, as I told you, artwork is to you as lifestyle is to mm-hmm. moi. And well, as performance art is to the civilian, the common-minded, yes. uh, I would call making same. Now, please be aware I did not say Sam, but instead Sam. Making Sam. It's a s- a m n. Salmon. Now, I'm not saying salmon, nor not am I saying Sam, but Sam. Now, when you spend about twelve of your years above the world, mm. twelve being uh, fifteen minus thrice. Precise. Yes. Now. When I come back down to earth, not in your layman's terms, but literally get pulled back in by gravitational force yes. and return to ground base, as you call mm-hmm. uh, the world, I really, I really realized um, that my stomach had missed out on 12 years of rational uh, nourishment. Mm-hmm. And now I thought, well, I've never experienced Households or a uh, private space, yeah, and you, so you lived in nothing but a floating. Bathroom. I assumed when I saw hobos fucking on the uh, the grasslands ah. that this was the world to bur. So you landed in Central Park. I landed in Central Park at the age of fifteen. At the age of fifteen, I saw first thing I saw returning to Earth was hobos fucking in a park in Central Park. That's and that's a. This is where I learned. That everything is possible here, here and now. Mm. And so I thought, well, the world is here, and this is where I be. And so if I'm going to make some sam, mm-hmm. which I can explain if you really want me to. Yeah, we, we'd, like, we'd like you to finish your thought first. Sa- okay. Well, I am thinking if I'm going to make some sam mm. to quench my 12th year um, hunger strike, I'm going to do it here and now. I start cooking and feasting and preparing mm-hmm. in that order, and a crowd gathers to and fro, fro and to, to see what is this boy, this 15-year-old child beast doing in mm-hmm. Central Park. I say, I'm making Sam. Would anybody like some? And a sheer shroud of fear comes upon the crowd. They say, this must be art. This is inhumane. This boy is in a bathtub cooking what God knows is not food. So the bathtub had landed, but you were still in the bathtub at the time. I did not know walking, Sang. That's true. You must. You hadn't used your legs for 12 years. Yes. It took Thallium another five years to tell me that my feet were worth mm. more than a splishy splash. So Thall- Thallium was with you at the time. Thallium, Thallium still is alive. still with me in my spare pocket. The shape-shifting shark. Is with you. He's with you today. Yes. Oh, that's that's exciting. I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. No. He. I. He's more of my. He's the teller to my pen, if mm. you will. If I were to make that requirement. He's, he's still the accompanist. Yes. He, he is my he's, accompanist. He's ex- his. Uh, his presence is solely musical. You might yes. Say. He, it is solely music. If you ever hear a note come out of my mouth, it means that Thallium has possessed me, and you must slap me and get me out of okay, my uh, way. Uh, <laughs> oh, m- get m- me Mr. out. Mr. Neodymium. Uh, y- y- Mr. Neodymium, I'm so sorry. Are you are you all right? I'm I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Um, if if that happens again, I don't I don't know if we have a, a person to do that. But um, usually Thallium's the one to do it for me. But it's also really hard to trust him. Because... Well, that's true because if if he's the one possessing you, then it's a conflict of interest. Yes. For him to then unpossess you. Yes. You never know where he stands then nowadays. Got it. I will. I'll keep my ears open for that musical cue. Thank you, sir. So. We, we've had a lot of different artists on the show talking about their galleries and where they are. And oh, yes. it's, they generally talk about it's very difficult to take up residence at the MOPA, as you have, the Museum of Passable Art. So how did that, how did that deal come about? How were you able to get your gallery in residence there? Well, you say deal as if I planned on it being there. As if I told them, hey, can I store my childhood in your factory workshop? And they said, oh, sh- oh sorry, mm. let me... Let- Oh, sure, as, as one would say. Mm-hmm. And now, this is not true, as I told you. I'm not an artist. 
I have been given that label since landing here, mm-hmm. and I would still like to believe I am just a shit boy, as I was told by <laughs> Thallium many times over. Ah. In the space so you, world. you and Thallium have an interesting relationship, I, from what I've gleaned. He has loved me romantically. Well, as a shape-shifting shark, I can understand that that would be... Uh, that would be as a, the uh, shark, and then he would shape-shift as into... As the shark. Into so, a mother figure. Got it. To so tuck was, me into the waters at night. You've had multiple relationships with but Thallium in terms of his he, shape-shifting. This man, mm-hmm. Sir Langford, who runs the MOPA... Yes, he is the, he's the CEO. I never... Fully met face to face. You could say I met him face to ass because. Did you now? I, uh, I only got a good look at his ass, from from where I was sitting. He wasn't facing you when he allowed your work to be exhibited. No, no, no. Because the only time I've ever met him was when he turned to throw up from me making sand in Central Park. So I got saw it. his ass as he threw up uh, his influ his fluids inside of me, mm. but. The way my my art, if you will, came to be in the MOPA mm-hmm. was simply through, uh, as you know, gravitational acceleration as we fall from mm-hmm. uh, space as to back to the ground. Space. Yes, no, I collided so aggressively with the ground mm-hmm. that I was forced into place. Uh, but my toys spread across the world, and I started shouting, "My toys!" My, t- my, t- it's all gone. Oh, God, somebody help. And five people in Central Park said, oh, we'll do it. And they took time out of their world time to go and find my toys. One had landed in Peru. One had landed in, one had landed in Sh- uh, Shvoliana. Mm-hmm. It, it was all over the world. And as they were found, news articles were spreading everywhere. Ooh. Rubber duck turns up in Peru. Uh, also, door falls from sky. And these articles meshed so well together. People mm. put these articles and they took them and they mm. were like, Sir Langford, you need to find this boy mm. or at least his artwork and you need to show the world what he's got. And he recognized you from throwing up in the opposite direction. He did not time. recognize me. He recognizes my toys. He still does not know my face. Got it. So he's on a very anonymous relationship with you, you would say. Yes. Much being he has stolen my toys, and I would like to get them back. That is actually why I came on your... uh, So you're actually the... I came on your show today, Sam, to uh, make a PSA, if you will, to Sir Langford. Sir Langford, you fucking fuck cunt. Please give me back my cunting boy toys. My, My goodness. That's oh, this is common. This is common ground for us. As you as you know, I am a shit boy, so this is all very knowledgeable. This is, this is, how, this is how Thalium talks. This is to okay. Speak. Yes. Thal- Th- Thalium, Thalium gave me a wise word of wisdom once. He said. He's, he's given you plenty of wise words, apparently. He once, when I was playing with Rubber Duke, mm-hmm. uh, as you have noticed by this point, he is not a duck, he is a duke. A Rubber Duke. It's a very different thing. He was well. I was playing with Rubber Duke in the in the waters of my mind. Thalim came to me and said, "Shish kebab, you cunty cunt cunt fuck. Please put the water back in the ground Mm -hmm. where the world is meant to be." And this is when I got inspiration to come back to Earth. And from then on, I have known uh, many uh, linguistic um, traverse obstacles to get past. In my time. Very true, yes. Having Coming from that language. Anyway, era. Sir Langford, please, um, please, g- um, I would like back just the rubber duke. You can keep the rest, shake a rattle, shaky, and you can also keep uh, all of the, uh, the uh, little bald boys that I like to call them. They were mm-hmm. uh, like ovular, um, and they looked like, uh, much like a penguin looks on earth. Uh, except not like a penguin and more like Rush Limbo. Huh. And I would like to say, uh, you can keep those because they are bad luck and and I would like you to have bad l- I would like you to have bad luck, Sir Lankford. I got him there. Yeah, so to reiterate, this is, I, this is groundbreaking. I absolutely can't believe this. You'd say that your, your current residency at the Museum of Passable Art was actually done without your excess approval. 
A hundred and ten percent. These were these were stolen from you and put up at the Mopa by Sir Langford without your express permission. Well, they were put up by his hands, not by his heart. Got it. Yes, important distinction to make. Yes. So what's as 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 the artist in residence and having obviously these works as your intellectual property. Artist. What's st- your lifestyle? I apologize. Thank you. What is stopping you as the lifestylist from simply? Uh, filing some sort of complaint with the Museum of Passable Art, uh, reclaiming the the rubber duke, as you said, which is, it's also very generous of you to allow the others of your stolen objects to remain in the museum. Like, what's stopping you from reclaiming the rubber duke? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, rubber duke and I go way back. Mm-hmm. Actually, before birth. Uh, he and I, when, when wandering through the mind state, of what it might be like to be human. He said, maybe I don't want to be human. Maybe I want to be rubber. And I said, you crazy fool twit. Mm-hmm. Why would this, you this do that? This was before you learned yes, your but, more extensive vocabulary from Fallon. Yes, and yes, where I said twit mm-hmm. instead of saying shit face. Yes. And now I, I expressed my emotional dis- disruptness mm-hmm. towards his face. In the ether and, of preconceptions. Yes, in the ether... <laughs> And I thought that in the ether, he might understand my words. Mm -hmm. He might understand my passion. And I say, why? And he says, the world can only hold so many of the common-minded. And I thought, well, whoa. Well, gee, good, wow. And as we were were both manufactured into the world, as you know, I was manufactured into the world. Ah, yes, factory made. Ah. He became a rubber duke, and I thought, well, by John Jit, he has become, oh my, well, by John Jit, he has become the rubber duke. Oh my good and god and goshness. He, and he as accomplished what he set out to do. As rubber duke, and I thought about this, this, this moment together, as he, I would think of what he would tell me as I knew him very well beforehand, up there, thrice to fifteen, he would say to my heart, this is all well this is where world wants me to be and you to be too as well also. Mm. And so as we come back, collided down into ground, etc., leads to him in the MOBA. I think to myself, well, although it is an art for most, it is a lifestyle not just for me, but also for Robert Duke. Mm. And as he would say, this is where he meant to be and me away from the MOBA Stuck ass first into the ground of Central Park with broken shards of tub in my tum. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is where I'm meant to be too as well also as well. And so I think I can't rescue him from where he's meant to be. I can't take him where, from where world has meant him to place him to be in the world. I shan't. Well, that's very, that, I have to say, that's very level-headed and uh, mature of you. And I let him keep the penguins because those fucks gave me such rashes from all the water. And those things are a whole nother story. You're going to pawn those penguins off on Sir Langford. Yes, that no, is, he that is. That is the price that he will pay. <laughs> oh, I got him. <laughs> he doesn't even know it. Because mm, he's certainly not going to be listening to this All he listens to soon. is the Disney radio station. So there's no way he's going to hear this. Unless you put this on the Disney radio station. I will, I'll check with my producers, but I, I'm reasonably certain that isn't going to happen. Okay, cool. So, um, oh, yes, I don't, I don't know how involved you are in this, but there have been rumors about a <clears throat> upcoming biopic from Paramount Pictures about your time spent in space on your floating childhood bathtub with uh, detailing the relationships between you, uh, Rubber Duke, and Thallium. Um, are you involved in the screenplay writing of this at all? Can you tell us a little bit about <coughs> it? Hold on, hold on. Give me a second. You said Paramount is backing this. Paramount Pictures. Yes. Shit. Uh, I'm, is that not the studio that? Do you have? Do you have some sort of grievance with Paramount Pictures? Paramount has been trying to get my biograph from me for two days now. That's excessive. Well, it is excessive when space does no not not time. It really doesn't. And. For me, two days is like however long it takes you to make salmon. And I don't know how long it takes you. I know how long it takes me, which is about two days, Mm -hmm. as I say. Um, Paramount and I. Oh, Paramount and I. Paramount, let me just put it this way, makes shit films. And 
<coughs> Excuse me. You're I haven't burped for and I've that's the first time I've ever burped. Well, congratulations. Thank you. I I well, they, I take off my hat to you, sir. But anyway, you're, um, it's a very nice hat. Your, your allegations against Paramount, this is, this is shocking. Well, when I wrote my book, which, as you know, is the 12-page, 100-page, mm -hmm. is where it goes 12 pages about me and then 100 pages about me talking about me. Um, as it states, me in my tub, my wondrous mind, and also... My theory about shadow people, as I've learned through traversity of universes and the cross pith paths. Ah. Ah. Uh, oh, have you not read it? I, I didn't get to that part, Mr. Neodymium. Ah, that is, that is page thrice. Mm -hmm. but, so, but anyway, so how did... <laughs> That's how a did, statement. How on earth is... You seem to have this history of uh, establishments that you're involved with somehow stealing your intellectual property and exhibiting without your permission. You've got the, the MOPA putting up this gallery that you had no part in uh, creating, and now you've got Paramount Pictures. Well, this all comes back to my latest art piece, as I have decided to make an art piece based off of people thinking I am an artist. Really? I made an art statement, if you will. I like to put it that way. Or, as you as you would say, the public, uh, the, the public display of affection. As you, uh, ah. Not, not really... I was naked when I did it, and that's really all I mean by that public display of affection. I, I, As I, I have heard, being naked is a public display of affection. I managed to imply that. But my statement has been to Sir Lankford and Prowlmount and also um, Amazon Kindle, as was to put up my biograph. Again, without your permission. Yes. You, yes. You, so you're, you've been taken advantage. I wrote of the bow to myself, and Thallium was supposed to publish it in the New York Timmy Tims, mm -hmm. where New York Timmies talked to Thallium. And that's where you got my quotes. Um, so you and Thallium have a very complicated relationship. Thallium has yes raped me over a couple, two or five times. That's, that's shocking, Mr. Neodymium. I well, I mean it in my terms, and I don't really know how to put it in your terms, but. I guess I'll try. What I mean is Thallium has kind of stuck his fin in my asshole a couple, two or five times. As, as, that as makes a, a little as bit a more As a shapeshifter, fight. it must be quite the experience. He shapeshifts to look like a grizzly man with a chest full of hair luxury. With but he fin. keeps the fin, yes. He keeps the fin. The, just for the in, in pleasure and indulgement. I, I don't... I don't. Anyway, really back to the, the artwork. The shape shark. Well, I don't think any element in the periodic table of Timmy Times doves, mm. except for Thallium. <laughs> but your, so your, your public display of affection regarding the fact that you've been taken advantage of so many Based times Based off, of off of the uh, humonic, and now let me bring it back to real artsy-like words, mm -hmm. it's based off of how people nowadays can become thyamus for the simplest reasons, reasons unknown, reasons against their will. Mm -hmm. As you know, Amanda Knox once became famous because people thought she had murdered her biabe, which she had not. Thallium had murdered her biabe, which mm -hmm. please understand right now, Adam Knox is just, she's just a bitch and that's it. She did not murder her biabe. Um, you heard it here. But listeners. she became famous for such reasons. Mm -hmm. As pranksters become famous for social experiments, which are just being cunts and being mean to people. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, O.J. Simpson became famous for murdering his wife, um, well, he became more famous. No. As... As the Unimomer... What? As the Unimomer... You have, you have a very interesting set of role and models, so Mr. On Neodymium. And so I'll, on and I'll, so forth. I'll say forth. that much. As the movie Click starring Adam Sandler became famous due to the fact that Christopher Walken actually jerked off in the background uh, while he had sex with... Well, uh, Adam Sandler had sex with... Uh, the benefic with his significant other in the sped up sex scene. You I'm know that one. I'm learning a lot today. I've watched Mr. that Neo one a couple of times. My point being, with YouTube and you too and you as well, you get people that have become famous for a many reason, whether against their will, for the reason they be brawl, or just because they say, I'm going to make a video. I'm sorry I have been off YouTube for a while. I promise I'm working on good stuff expected in the future. We'll and an that gets them the updates. Video, Thank you. It is very popular nowadays. I have about 70-some follow-cribers. Hmm. And uh, 
my point being, when you are in a world filled with wonder and watch not, even the shittiest people still become MOBA artists. That's almost profound, Mr. Neodymium. Well, that about wraps it up for our time here today. Again, uh, Mr. Neodymium's gallery, Echoes of Tub Toys Past, is available at residency now at the Museum of Passable Art. Ernest Neodymium, thank you so much for being on the program today. Well, thank you for having me, Simon. It's been utterly fantastic. We are going to take a brief break, and we will be right back to welcome back. Welcome back to Welcome Back. I am your host, Zane Shaw, and today I have a beautiful guest with me. Yeah. You may know him very well as the man who once spent four years of his life thinking about what it might be like to be stranded on a deserted island. Note he never was, but he always thought about it. He is very well known for being notoriously famous, for having a lot of people know who he is, and you might also know him, if you are Sasha, however, as the tree in the woods who twisted his body in the harsh winds to guide you home. Uh, please welcome Franz Quakem. Quakem, nice to have you on the show. It's nice to be here, Mr. Shaw. I'm beside myself practically well i'm also beside you <laughs> yeah, we've got now, let's, now let's get into the questions shall we oh, all right fantastic. let's just touch on your vision right now let's right off the bat on, on the being stranded tap, all right tap. so for four years all right that's correct you come home tell me if i'm wrong on any of this you, mm -hmm. you come home to your comfortable house you sit down and for a minute or two you think hmm all right if if i sat in a chair like Right here, right Absolutely. now. Would I still sit in a chair if I was stranded on a deserted island? Mm -hmm. Is that about how like your visions went? That's more or less. Yeah, I would sit. I would sit down. For this is uh, this is back when I was living in over in uh, Oklahoma. All right. And as you said, my house it was very comfortable. Uh, uh, when I moved into that house, it was uh, it was very bare at first. I'm like, I need to make this a very comfortable space. Bought all sorts of bean bags, uh, fluffy animals, that sort of thing. Most Ooh. comfortable place I've ever lived in in my life. Very nice. And I would come home from my job at that point, very sort of office cubically job very that kind of soul eating thing that makes your mind want to escape and go other places right right and i would come home and i would sit down in the more comfortable spots in my oklahoma apartment and for a minute or two my mind would just wander and i would think about whatever i was doing or whatever thoughts i'd have on that particular day but in the context of being on a desert island so that first day the first day you always you have to start very simple that's, right that's what i was taught growing up yeah and so i would sit down and i would be it was about the idea of sitting down it's like what would i do if i was sitting down but instead of being in my in my comfy Oklahoma digs, I was on a deserted island. And for the first couple of weeks or so, those two minutes of mind escapery, very simple things like that. Like, what if I was sitting but on a desert island? What if I was had my legs crossed one over the other like ways, like a pretzel, but on a desert island? What if I was looking out the window, looking at that uh, V bird formation and wondering is why birds do that, but I was doing that on a desert island? And so on and so forth. And for the again, for the first few months, those lines of thoughts were very simple, and I sort of started from that groundwork uh, to build up for the four years of thought that followed directly afterwards. So you would go, uh, so you go to work Absolutely. at a cubicle office, place. Cubicle very office. dull, very down. Very dull. Everything was gray. They didn't allow you to wear anything except gray clothes. Almost resembling a desert island, if you will. In a, in it's a, a, in a, in a metaphorical way. If you were one of those one of those uh, like film student types where everything has to be a metaphor, it might be very easy for you to make that sort of connection. And you would come home to your comfortable house, my very comfortable and Oklahoma think days. about yourself in the setting that you were presumably just in, in a metaphorical sense. In a metaphorical sense, it's interesting. I've I've been I've been asked this question before, and I'm very glad that you actually brought it up, Mr. Shaw, about uh, thinking of the, sort of the desert island of which I thought was an escape from the corporate environment that I had been entrenched in when I was living in Oklahoma, but was actually a recontextualization of the environment that I was already in. Very fascinating. Because the sort of, the level of isolation and uh, being without resources and sameness, one, one can look at that on a very sort of surface value and compare the uh, cubicle wasteland of the Oklahoma corporate uh, structure with a desert island. But when you really start to sort of dig into the specificity that's where the differences come out in full. On the desert island, there is this sense of freedom that comes with not being surrounded by other things that are identical to you. Because when you are working in a cubicle situation, on your right, there is a cubicle identical to your own. 
there is a man very close in identicalness to yourself, and he is doing work nearly identical to your own work. In front of you, on the left of you, underneath you, this was a three-dimensional cubicle structure, much like a sort of hamster cage with lots of little hamsters in it. There are men doing the same thing, but when you are on a desert island, no matter how boring or pointless your work is, you are the only desert island. Now, can I cut you yourself. off real quick? You're you're mentioning something over and over again that's actually uh, very important to my next question. Very important. Lead um, right in. You keep saying now when you're on a desert island, when as I'm if you can be island. on a desert island. Absolutely. But um, you were quoted by PBS Kids once saying that uh, deserted is. islands are sort of like popsicles because you know they're possible. Um, however. You went on to publish a 90 page article about how deserted islands are not possible. Can you care to comment yes. on that? This, this was the possible popsicles uh, debacle. We mm -hmm. call it uh, Popsgate back yes. in my sort of a, a HR uh, company that I work with. Yes. And the reason I said the, the term possibility is sort of a very loose uh, concept in where I way. was raised and how I was thought about it in the terms of university. And so. A popsicle is possible in the way that you can go down to the uh, community pool and on a nice summer day and you can buy yourself a popsicle from the popsicle stand and enjoy that popsicle and have yourself a nice old time. Right. But the way in which popsicles are not possible is that you cannot create a popsicle because popsicles, what ha the, the means for which they are created is nobody knows. They just show up. At, uh, shacks at the community pool yes. and you go and you buy them and nobody knows how to explain that. You transfer that level of possibility over to the idea of a desert island. It is very possible to imagine the concept of a desert island to take yourself in your comfortable Oklahoma digs and transport your mentality to the idea of being on a desert island and in that sense it is possible the way that you can acquire a popsicle but for the actual creation of the situation to actually travel to a desert island and be fully in that mindset is not possible. And this is why I, the four years that I spent were solely in terms of a conceptual possibility of being on an island rather than being on an island itself. This is amazing. You're opening my mind up to like a whole new world of That's possible thinking. That's why I'm thinking. here, Mr. Shaw. Now, that, that leads me into uh, a little bit of a, I want to touch on a different segment that Absolutely. I mentioned in the it's beginning. your interview. Um, you are the captain of this ship. Now, I'm not, I'm not surprised as to if this actually happened or whatnot. It wouldn't catch me off guard, but I want to touch on a little bit of an off-topic form that came with Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Uh, so, Sasha Feldman, 23-year-old girl mm -hmm. uh, from your hometown, yes. once said that she had gotten lost in the woods and that an old twisted oak tree that kind of resembled your face mm -hmm. uh, bent in the wind and led her home. Now, it's presumed that you were that tree, but as all, as even though if that doesn't catch me off guard, if that were to be true or not, mm -hmm. I wanted to bring up a little bit of a, of a touchy subject that kind of fits into that category. As we all know, all of mm -hmm. us. Absolutely. Uh, we know your dad was killed by Tree Boy. Yes. Uh, and... You once swore vengeance for your father. Mm -hmm. So if you were out in those woods, were you out there to help a lost soul like Sasha, or were you out there to tie up loose ends? Yes. I'm very, I, also, I also want to thank you specifically for having your producers uh, warn me ahead of time that we were going to be talking about this, because yeah. I, as you know, I've walked out on plenty of interviews where my father and uh, Tree Boy are mentioned. No, we care but, about uh, you. But I'm, but I'm glad I, made, I, I wanted a sort of chance to, uh, to clear the air publicly, yes. as it were. Please, tell the people. So, uh, my my father was, yes, and this is about the story of Miss Sasha. My father was a very honest, hardworking man, and he was a woodsman. He would work in the forest. He would uh, collect lumber for mm -hmm. the, uh, the buildings that were made in the town where I was a child. And uh, he, was, he was unmarried. There were uh, plenty of young women in the Oklahoma towns that would... Uh, uh, come up to him and ask, tell them, tell him uh, th their dowries and offer themselves in marriage. But he was his his love, his life, and his lady was the woods. And that would that would be what he said. Uh, Enoch Quakem, that was his name. He would he would give the answers, uh -huh. and people asked him, Enoch, why don't you go and get yourselves married with a nice young gal and get yourself a family? And his response would always be, My love, my life, and my lady is the woods. Beautiful. And he and and he had no idea when he originally started saying that how true that sentence would end up being because his first wife and my biological mother was a wood nymph. And for, for the viewers listening in who don't really know what a wood nymph is, 
wood nymphs are these these humanoid spirits yes. that live in the trees. Right. If you've ever read the uh, Dr. Seuss book, The Lorax, which is a uh, very high quality piece of literature, I high. absolutely recommend that high you do that there. if you don't do that. Uh, it's sort of these, these spirits that represent the trees, but uh, they are not the trees themselves. Their physical forms are much more attractive to the human eye than trees are, right. which is how my father, given the fact that his life, his love, and his lady was the woods, would meet a wood nymph and fall in love with a wood nymph such as myself. And uh, he married this wood nymph, and he had a pair of twins, one of which was me, the, the first Quakem, and my brother, Chestnut Quakem, but, uh, of course, his, the sobriquet that he became more famous for going by was the infamous Tree Boy. Now, uh, yes. now Tree Boy and I, my brother Tree Boy and I growing up, um, we had our differences, you know, of, uh, of the sort of mix in our genealogy of human being from my father Enoch and a wood nymph coming from my mother who was a wood nymph. Wood nymphs don't have names. Right. The reason me and Tree Boy had names was because of my father Enoch. So I, as you can tell from looking at me and seeing my uh, complacency, don't have as much of the wood nymph genealogy in my genes. Right. But Tree Boy was sort of the opposite. He yes. was like 90% wood nymph with that, with that spark of human ambition that I right, think was right. what led him down the path that he eventually uh, became known for. And as we grew up, he, he began to resent my father because I'm a generally easygoing person. I was very easygoing growing up. This is what I was taught by my father, Enoch. I was able to get along with my father and my mother, the wood nymph, equally. But uh, because of his deep-seated wood nymph nature, my brother Treboy was never really able to connect with my father on the same level that I was, which uh, led to the feud later on when my father wanted my brother Treboy to get an honest education, and he uh, wanted to live in the woods and start up a pine cone selling business, which my father absolutely disapproved of. Pine cones were not on his agenda as for things to be approved of the sale of his family. And that, of course, led to the fight and uh, the, the ending of my father's life by, by Tree Boy's wrath. Which I'm very sorry about. And, yes, I've, I've had plenty of time to work over it. And this, this leads into the story of Sasha. Yes. This was a few years ago. It was uh, the fifth anniversary of Enoch's murder at the hands of Tree Boy, my brother right. Tree Boy. And I decided that the way that I would be able to really come to terms with his death and get that sense of closure was to go and spend time in the woods, as it were, to really understand why his love, his life, and his lady was the woods. So I enter the woods, and I enter this, this state of being where I'm very in tune with the woods, and the latent wood nymph genes that resided in my DNA right. became active, and, and my skin started to take on the consistency of a tree, ah. and their uh, branches started to, to grow out of my arms, and my arms themselves became branches, and my body, the trunk of a large tree, but uh, much like the tree in the movie Pinocchio, uh, not Pinocchio, Pocahontas. I always get those two confused. Very similar names. Very similar my, movies. A, the visage of my face remained uh, visible in the trunk of the tree. And it, this was uh, at this point that Miss Sasha entered the woods. And, of course, I had grown up with her. I knew her very well. And I could tell that she was lost by the fact that she was uh, looking around very worried and by the fact that she kept saying over and over again, I am lost. I am a lost person. I right. am a person who does not know where my home is. Right. And again, I was able to infer from that that she did not know where she was going. But uh, as, as my recently acquired tree body, I did not have full range of motion, so I, was, I looked very twisted and I was very uncomfortable. Ah. But because I had, I had locked upon this knowledge of the woods that my, my wood nymph ancestry had given me in that moment, I was able to, as, as difficult as it was physically, manipulate one of my new arm branches to point in the direction that the wood nymph spirits were informing me that Sasha's home lay. And uh, I spent a week in the woods in my, in my tree form, as I've grown to call it, my tree self. And after that, I was able to shed that woody skin, return to my mostly human form. I had made peace with Tree Boy and my father Enoch and the wood nymph, and I, I came out of the woods a very changed man. Very fascinating. You know, you were full of wonder. It's, it's very I, therapeutic to talk about that. I which, appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Of course. Now that brings me into a, another segment of, so you're a, you're very well known. You're Absolutely. very well known mm -hmm. for being notoriously famous. That, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure that's, that's affected your personal life in good ways and bad ways, but I want to touch on a very specific moment that happened um, last November. Ah, yes. Where an eyewitness 
caught you at a Starbucks mm-hmm. because they, you know, they recognize you because you're exactly. notoriously famous, and a barista asked for your name, mm-hmm. which would imply that she does not know you. Uh, how does how does that make you feel? Yes, this was this was last November. The the barista I had ordered my um, clap of mochaccino, and she asked me my name. And I think the reason she asked me my name is because, of course, being that I'm well known for being notoriously famous, she knew that I was Franz Quakem. But oh. you, the, here's here's the thing about Starbucks is that what I've always admired about them is that their method of employment. They have always been a very equal opportunity employer. And the young men and women who can't get hired by other companies because they don't know how to spell will get to work at Starbucks. They've been Ah. a very accommodating company, which is why very often you have these uh, young people ordering their drinks at Starbucks and getting their name spelled wrong. It has has nothing to do with any sort of uh, uh, vice or malice or malignance on the Starbucks staff. It is simply that the parts of their brains that can spell things have not been developed as much as people that... uh, that other companies hire, but that Starbucks is able to reach a hand out to. She knew my name was Franz So you're Franz saying Quaker. she didn't, she just didn't know how she to spell She just didn't know how to spell Franz. Oh, okay. Which I, which I had to spell out for her. Well, um, actually, uh, so, so you're saying that the eyewitness that said that they overheard, uh, what's your name, mm. misheard and really said, uh, how do you spell yes. your name? Well, you see, the reason for that is that you got your quote from an eyewitness. If you would wanted uh, an accurate quote for what I said, you would have needed an ear, ear witness. witness. Yes. Exactly. So uh, you should always double check your sources, Mr. Shaw. Make sure you're getting the right uh, sense. I just wanted to clarify doing. with you. You know, yes. easy I mistake. To get it all Every, out of the everyone way. makes them. All right. Um, one thing that's really interesting to me is some. Uh, well, I don't want to say creepy, but uh, you know, as you are a wondrous and mysterious man absolutely it could be a little odd okay I've, I've so been, i've been labeled with worse adjectives over the past couple of days um oh, yes, people this is recent activities people have seemed to uh not been able to find you during the night time uh yes. and they're trying to connect this to an incident that happened back july 8th to 15th mm-hmm. uh where at night you were gone uh, except for every night you would pop up on a different rooftop and you would howl, uh, what's, what's the phrase? Um, Tis as old by firelight and the reckoning of old Uh So now nobody's heard that phrase recently come out of your mouth. Nobody spotted you on a rooftop. However, that is where they are looking, just so you know. Um, now, if you want to clarify on the whole disappearing at night and being on rooftops or like who pish pipa is or whatnot and yes. now now feels like a good time to clear the air if you might yes, if the, you uh, the 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 pish papa chronicle absolutely yeah so back back in july there there was that very short week of disappearances where i would turn up on rooftops i would uh recite the brief poem which you were able to quote for me word for word with that about this pish pipa fellow yes and pish pipa was an acolyte of the Church of Regurgitated Crane Angles. Oh. And this, this, was, this was a religious cult that operated in Oklahoma when I was growing up with my uh, uh, nymph mother and my Enoch uh, Quakem father. Now, the Church of Regurgitated Crane Angles, uh, very, very fine church. They, their, their holiday services were lovely. They would always uh, hand nice. out crane angles to the young children. Yes. Uh, people would go up with baskets or... If, if they didn't have a basket, they would take their aprons and hold them up like an upsy-down parachute. Right. Pe- uh, the church of regurgitated crane angles would throw the crane angles out like like rice at a wedding. It was absolutely fantastic sight to see. Beautiful. But Pish Piper, now Pish Piper was an acolyte of the church's services, and he had worked his way up to a blue eye sash. Now, in similar to the, so you have sort of karate people earning belts yes. on the uh, the white to black scale. Uh, this is what they do with eyelashes. They would eye sashes. Excuse me. Very similar words. Yes. They would give you an eye sash uh, on achieving a certain level of familiarity with the sacred text of the Church of Regurgitated Crane Angles, the uh, Angle Bible, and uh-huh. detailing the different types of crane angles that can be found in the world and given out to young children like rice at a wedding. Fascinating. Now, Pish Piper was very. He was notorious, and this is actually why he became excommunicated for the church for delving into 
ideas of mental possession. Oh. Being, being able to enter someone's mind and taking control of their bodies and their voices. He had done studies uh, with the School of Shapeshifting Sharks that had also practiced this profession. And that, that, sort, that sort of research had never been done before. You understand, these things existed, but people sort of thought they were crazy enough to leave them be. But Pish Piper took that extra step into shapeshifting shark possessive territory at the Church of Regurgitated uh, Crane Angles. But, and so when I met Pish Piper, he planted this seed in my mind that would take years and years to reach its full effect. And in those, in those days of July 8th to 15th, that seed very briefly became a blooming flower that would cause me to go out in the night, mount people's roofs, and uh, lament the fact that Pish Piper had done this to me. Now, ah, okay. So that, that explains the July disappearances. And, but you see, the thing about flowers, especially uh, mind shock, translucive, possessive powers, is that they never, flower powers, mm -hmm. is that they never bloom the same way twice. So. Yes, my, my, my wife and my contemporaries have been telling me about the fact that I've been disappearing again. I do not know where I am going to. These are like sleepwalking episodes. Um, last time it was roofs. It could be basements this time. It could be uh, by the sides of porta potties. It may be uh, perched upon a street lamp, much like a raven atop a bust of palace. Uh, but I know that wherever I am being found, I am, I am speaking another chapter of the forbidden gospel of Pish Piper, dark shark acolyte of the Church of Regurgitated Crane Angles. Uh, this is this is an ongoing saga. I'm sure that in another five to six months, I will be uh, popping up in some new locale, perhaps church alcoves, perhaps underneath tables of conference rooms. But I know that wherever I am, the seed of my unconscious is writing this saga of Pish Piper and his teachings. And uh, all I can say is that. This, this just goes to show what an influence religion can have on a person's childhood. That, that is fascinating. Every, every word out of your mouth is fascinating. You know what? Once you again, it's quite therapeutic to be able to talk about this. I appreciate yeah, no, the opportunity. Yeah, no problem at all. You seem like just a smart guy. I just want to get, like, you, oh, don't have you, to, you don't have to emphasize on it. I just, like, want to get a really quick mm -hmm. question out there because you seem really smart and you seem interested in, oh, like, well, all of these kind of subjects or whatnot. Like, like, on a potato. Do you have a favorite element? Do I have a favorite element? Just like I want to throw Element out there. of the periodic table. Yes. You know, I'm going to have to go ahead and say tungsten. Oh. It is a very dense element. It is very easily available. And I, uh, I once knew a chameleon whose name was tungsten. And the reason I appreciated this name for him is because the chameleon had an interest in elemental science. And so he wanted to... Oh, oh, oh hold on. He wait, wanted wait, to... What? Oh yes, you. Um, is your producer telling so you something? So I, yeah, no, I'm getting, I'm getting word right now. So, um, mm -hmm. since you've entered the building, the West Coast has vanished. Um, the entire West Coast. Yes, we don't mean the people. We mean all of it, friends. We need to know right now. Are you the gatekeeper? Am I the? G oh. You know, this is the type of thing I was talking about. I was glad your producers mentioned to me at first that you were going to be talking about Tree Boy and the murder Friends, of my father. We don't, I'm sorry, we don't have much I was, time. I was we told to know. that this was not going to be brought up in the interview, Mr. Shaw. Friends, it is not my place to we, speak about the gatekeeper we on this here radio interview. We didn't expect the West Coast to disappear because well, we had you on the show. Well, the thing you have to know is... <coughs> are, you, are you okay? Are you... Friends, are you all, are you all right? The flame in the wind is extinguished through time. The West Coast has mm -hmm. has places that, that it needs to be. Somebody get Pish Papa is covered. Pish Papa get... will regurgitate. You getting this? The crane angles will come. Put this on world the star. coast will vanish. World star. Pish Papa. World star. Pish Papa. <coughs> you good? Are you good? Oh, I I I apologize for that, Mr. Shaw. I, I must have had a, <clears throat> a, a dizzy spell or, or or something relating to that thereof. I um yeah. It sometimes happens you good? when I talk for long periods of time, I, I, I tend to blank out for a minute. What, what were you saying? Now, um, yes, my chameleon friend, he, uh, yes. he named himself Tungsten because he wanted an element that spoke to his natural abilities as a chameleon to use as his alter ego in the world of elemental science. And because he had a very long tongue that he would use to fetch berries off of the branches of trees, he decided that by calling himself Tungsten, not only would he be able to put across to people that he was an elemental scientist, but that he also enjoyed using his tongue as a food-getting tool, so to speak. 
This has been a wonderful conversation. Well, from I have appreciated it so Franz much. Franz Quakem, everybody. Such a lovely man to have on the show. And if you ever want to know anything more about this man, just go into the woods and look around. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if, be I, if I go on one of my retreats, whether or not I'm a tree or putting myself in the mindset of being on an island, I may end up in the woods and I may be able to, through the sheer force of will, guide you on your way home. Fascinating stuff. Well, thank you for being on the show. All thank right? you very much for having me, Mr. Shaw. All right. Yes, that's been uh, – I'm your host, Zane Shaw. This has been my friend, Sam Fiddler. We have had a conversation, and I'm glad that you listened. And please uh, come back to Welcome Back. We'd like to welcome you back to Welcome Back because when we welcome you back, we are welcoming you b- back. Uh, uh, bye, everybody. Sam, you want to say bye to anybody? Do I want to say bye to anybody? Yes. No. All right. Um, well, you heard. I it. refuse. You've heard it here, folks. Um, not maybe not first, but you've definitely heard it here because you, you heard just it. heard it. And uh, well, you know what? Uh, see you soon. Back to welcome back. See you soon.